Again, I'm happy to introduce Ben Jones from CERN. Uh, he's responsible for DevOps there and apparently escaped the financial industry to do it, so we all have him to thank. Uh, and he's here to discuss configuration management at CERN. Thank you, everyone, and thanks for coming. Um, talking about configuration management at CERN, and the, the subtitle is From Homegrown to Industry Standard, but it could just as easily have been uh, when we discovered that our infrastructure was completely different and uh, we decided, therefore, that we should maybe change it because it was broken. Um, I'm going to give you an agenda again. I used to work at a bank, so obviously agendas are a big thing. Um, I'll tell you first about um, what we were doing before Puppet, uh, a sort of brief history of how we did configuration management at CERN. Um, I'll talk to you about our current Puppet deployment, uh, where we are with that, and I'll tell you, I mean, it's kind of... Um, our future plans are what works and things we like and then things we don't quite get yet, rather than things we don't like. I think it's, uh, it's more that we probably don't understand where we are yet. And things like this, events like this, are really helping us to, uh, to, to come to terms with the right way of doing things. Um, and then at the end, I'll, ask, uh, I'll uh, open it up for questions. Uh, a bit like myself, my name's Ben Jones. I did work at um, uh, a Wall Street bank um, for 10 or 13 years before I managed to get to, uh, to CERN. Um, the, the size of CERN, one of the things that we talked about, and I think it's on the next slide, I think I'm sure you, most of you saw Tim's talk. Um, we're currently at just under 12,000 nodes, uh, which is, is, is quite a modest size for compute. Uh, I know lots of plants are kind of smaller, but when you're coming from something like financial services, it seems nowadays at least that that's not actually very much. Uh, data is obviously another story. If you look at the, uh, the amount of petabytes that's being generated by the uh, collider all the time, then uh, obviously we've got a, a much different problem. Um, but this, in terms of the IT background, how we do analysis helps us try and work out how we manage the computers. See the map uh, behind me, that's uh, all the places that currently where we've got uh, certain uh, data being analyzed. So we have uh, the central site uh, between uh, Switzerland and France which is where tier zero, that's where we're generating all the data. That gets shipped out to tier one and then gets shipped out to all the different other places around the uh, globe that are doing the analysis. Um, so it means that we do end up having uh, lots of services that are managed by admins for in lots of different parts of the world. Uh, so we're, we're definitely, um, even though on site at CERN, we can manage problems by just sticking your head out the door and shouting down the corridor um, in terms of how we the rest of the plant is managed. It's certainly not on that scale. We have to deal with distributed um, administration. So this is kind of our config diversity, which is the other thing uh, that's, that's sort of important. This is the current state of our plant, and you can't see all the names of all the different clusters. We call a, a cluster is basically uh, an application, and we'd like to think of each application being uh, a quite homogenous set of stuff with all a configuration that's quite similar, but if you look at this, and it's, it's not to scale, but we've got a, the first line is uh, where we've got a number of hosts under 10, and you can see under, over a, you know, a third of our plant is uh, clusters that are actually quite small. Um, most of them are under 100. It's only when you get to the end where you get big things like uh, batch, our batch system and some of the big things that are doing from some of the experiments where they've got uh, a, a large amount of... Uh, a, um, hosts for a cluster. But even within that, we've got lots of um, sub-configurations. So the idea that you can have a very uh, common um, config that's shared amongst a lot of nodes is not always uh, the case. It's not always that easy. So where we started, and we had a, we had a project called the, uh, led to something called the Extremely Large Fabric Management System, which when we were as far as we were concerned, extremely large, uh, which is, and at the back time, it's probably uh, the, the beginning, sort of early noughties, 2002 or so, um, there wasn't a lot of choice for config management, uh, so we made our own one. Uh, so uh, writing our own thing is, is, uh, is something that we've done quite a lot in the past, maybe something that we'd prefer not to continue doing. Um, it wasn't just a CERN project, I should make that clear. It was an EU data grid project. Um, so lots of people uh, with European funding uh, and lots of stuff around high energy physics where we do 
uh, collaboration. Uh, that tool trade included Quator. Quator was a tool that does configuration management. It still does configuration management. Uh, you can go to quator.org, and uh, there is some documentation there. It's, uh, it's, uh, it's certainly not anything up to the, the standard of, uh, of Puppet. And certainly we had, uh, so Quator from 30,000 feet, um, it was, so it had some of the similar sort of things that you get in things like Puppet. We have a declarative language. Uh, this is some up there that you can see where you can have something, you can uh, use data structures to, with a schema to create something that's uh, almost like a resource in Puppet. Uh, so here's some user access to, uh, to get users onto the box. Uh, there's a compiler called PanC which compiled all those things into big XML blobs. And those XML blobs were something that described uh, an entire node and all of the templates together do, uh, managed with the idea was it described the entire fabric, the entire um, system. Um, once uh, you did compilations, each machine used to get notified. You get notified to say something had changed. It was just a little UDP message. The node is supposed to decide what to do itself. Um, it would go to the configuration server, say, has my configuration changed? Download it if it has, and then have software components that ran on the machine, then then decided whether or not there was something they cared about that changed. So if we just changed the uh, user access, the user access component would fire up and make the, the changes to the box. Um, so the problems we had with that was, firstly, is the templates describe the entire plant. Now, there are some benefits to that. If you have uh, uh, the entire plant that you can manage to do client server stuff, so you can say your DHCP server knows what clients it has, so you can use that data to, uh, to configure your DHCP server. Um, but it also means that, you know, you, that any changes throughout the system can, uh, can affect anything else. So we had uh, spaghetti dependencies. And uh, any time the compiler is smart, so any time you wanted to change something, it would only compile the one object uh, that had any changes. But because the dependence is all over the place, that uh, could lead to really long compile times. Um, so most of the time, the things that people are most annoyed about is waiting for doing a config change and then waiting for half an hour for the config server to get around to, to doing its thing. Um, it's also very easy to break everything. So you can break not just your machine, but everybody's machine all at once. Um, the other thing we didn't have is we didn't have uh, facts, and facts is something that has kind of been really useful for us. Um, so hardware is one of the things where uh, facts are very useful. When we were getting in hardware before, we'd buy a load of hardware, and then we'd tell the system what the hardware was. So firstly, we have to uh, either accept what the vendor's telling us and write it all down, and there's a manual step to get it all in the system. Uh, and there's no sort of feedback from the hardware itself, at least in the config management system at first to be able to, uh, for it to tell you what it is. Um, the other problem we had with Quatter is the sweet spot was lots of commonality. And these are the kind of problems, if you go back to the slides I had earlier, we have lots of distributed admi administrators and lots of config diversity, which means that Quatter increasingly isn't really um, helping with that. So uh, we got to do, and I only started at CERN in March, and I arrived, and we were doing something that's quite exciting when you're working in IT for a while, which actually you need to do a brand new project, a greenfield project. Although obviously with some things past a certain size, most of the time any project is, is really a brownfield project, right? You've got to talk to all the other systems that you need to care about. Um, so this was kind of our stack. This is a poster that uh, somebody made for the, one of the high energy physics uh, conferences. Uh, these are the kind of components that we're using. So we're using Puppet, obviously, OpenStack, uh, and things like the Foreman, the Foreman to do uh, uh, sort of life cycle, uh, Hyro we're getting, or Hiero, or whatever you want to call it, um, M Collective, Koji to do automatic builds, uh, Git obviously, and it says ActiveMQ, but the uh, messaging guys are probably telling me ActiveMQ or Apollo or something. So, but anything that to do both uh, M Collective and as a sort of monitoring bus. Um, our hardware provisioning. Um, we do use a, uh, one of our homegrown tools still, and we, we're still developing it to bootstrap um, hosts. Um, lo lots of the stuff that we have to do to do that is interacting with other data stores. So we have to add things into Foreman, for instance, but we also have CERN specific databases that you have to do things to. So you have to add things to our network database in order to get registered so you can get an IP. So there's lots of sort of things like that. It's also doing 
uh, burn in, making sure that things that hardware that we that arise isn't dead on arrival, um, and so on and so forth. And yeah, the, the final step is to add something to Foreman so that it becomes part of our provisioning. Uh, I'll talk a bit about Foreman, um, which is um, one thing is we're really very happy with it. The Kickstart templating that we've been using quite heavily. Um, the host group organization, I don't know how many of you saw OHAD's uh, talk, but the host group is very similar to the way we did clusters before, except our clusters were basically a flat namespace, whereas in Foreman we can nest host groups. So um, and I'll show an example of that later. Um, we're looking to use uh, Foreman for OpenStack, or looking to see how we can use it to do OpenStack provisioning. Uh, I think we've submitted a few pull requests recently to do that, so uh, we're quite excited. Um, and we love being able to use the API. Having to integrate something with lots of other systems means that the, having an API that can at least do most of the things you can do with everything else is extremely important. So this whole solution is kind of, I mean, it's kind of in the same space of Razor. We, we, the very, it was fun watching the Razor talk and seeing this kind of thing. We are tracking the project. But again, it's, it's not just the provisioning that we're looking at. It's how we interact with all these other different systems that already exist within CERN, some of which we, we want to get rid of eventually and some of which we're probably stuck with for a while. Uh, virtual provisioning, which is the, the other side of it. Um, we have a pre-existing infrastructure that we use, um, which is mainly Microsoft Hyper-V. Uh, we, at the moment, we're pre-registering um, these, these uh, images in Foreman. Uh, and they do kickstart installation. So it's all quite old school kind of way of managing a virtualized plant. Um, we're moving to uh, OpenStack using OpenStack Nova. Uh, some of the things that we've got um, last week, and it was in Tim's talk, we've uh, just started up a 1,000 VM Boink uh, six track, which is the LHC at home. Uh, that's working, although not yet running Puppet to configure it. It's still using Cloud in it to do some basic configuration, but we've got the the Boink um, Puppet module that we're uh, contributing back. Um, we are either going to have, either we have it now while I've been away or we will have next week. This is a 4,000 VM a batch test bed. So our batch system, which was our biggest uh, cluster that you saw, we, we're trying to do some uh, testing, trying to do some renovation, looking at other uh, batch systems. And we hopefully we'll have a, a Puppet managed uh, 4,000 VM test bed. Uh, the aim eventually is to support, you know, under 20,000 hypervisors with a density probably, I mean, the, the figures that we quote is between 100 and 300,000, so that kind of works out, I guess, about up to 20 to 1. Um, the images we're making uh, with Oz, uh, and the idea is not to do any uh, pre-registration in Foreman. We want to be able to just, because sometimes this, this cattle model where you just want to go to Nova, especially with a batch system, and just say, I need 200 nodes to... Uh, run something, um, you get those 200 nodes, you want to just configure them, get them with all the things you need, get the trust to sign, have certificates, and then throw them away when you're done. You don't want to have to go through, name them, and put them into a system. You just want all that to kind of happen for you. Um, so that's what we're looking at. Using, we're using cloud in it going forward. AMI config is something, again, that's kind of pre-existing with some of the rest of the plant. Okay, this is kind of what we did to scale out Puppet a little, um, we've, uh, we've got, at the moment, we've got a couple of Puppet Masters. Um, we, the, the idea is we think we can scale that up on demand if we need to. And certainly when we get up to the big numbers, that's probably what we'll look at doing. Uh, we've got a couple of Foreman servers. Uh, the only little bit of uh, uh, extra integration there is we put memcached in front of the database uh, just to get around having settings defined on one of the other foreman, we just, just cached that in mcached. The other thing, and this is kind of one of our integration points, we have our own CA server, and so we kind of want to use it. I'm kind of interested, does anybody else use their own CA server with Puppet, or do they just use the Puppet one? No one? I know, yeah, thank you. <laughs> oh, I know. So yeah, there are various bugs with using your own CA server, but it's something we want to do. Uh, so we're kind of pegged to a release with a hack that we've got a puppet to support our own CA server, but if you have if you have one, we want to use it. And also, when you start uh, integrating things like M Collector, we we want to be able to do that with our own certificates. We don't want to have its own uh, certificate management system. So that's one of the things. Um, and in fact, that's the first thing I did when I arrived at CERN. They I arrived and they said, "Can you integrate um, uh, our CA with with uh, Puppet?" And I was like, "That sounds easy, sure." And it's uh, three or four months later. 
it's, it's not been as, uh, as easy as it could have been. But, you know. Um, OK, so the change process that we're currently using to manage uh, um, modules and so forth. Um, we use a Git service that we're using for all the modules and the manifest and actually for the uh, uh, Hyredata. Um, we have any of the Git branches uh, maps to dynamic environments, so it creates the, the environment automatically. We have uh, a, a Git Lite repository um, that we're that anybody that is permission to can do it. But Git Lite, again, somebody mentioned it earlier. Git Lite is is fantastic. I urge you all to to use it. Um, the Puppet Master is currently because uh, they pull. We don't have. We, you could do a post commit if you were cleverer than we were when we set it up, but we, they pull and then translate the branches into uh, environments. So we have the sort of normal sort of production, testing, QA, whatever uh, branches. Uh, we do topic branches for major changes. So when we did the scale out, uh, we had a topic branch to manage all that change for a while. And some services like to live in their own branches. And this is the kind of thing that when you're working, and I'm sure any of you that worked in a sort of academic setting, uh, it's a lot different to when you're working in a, a sort of centralized, like uh, paranoid financial institution where the IT department can say, this is the way you will do it, and that's, that's it. Here, if, if people want their own uh, way of doing things, they, they will get it, and there's nothing we can do about it. So the, having, the, uh, having their own branches, there is a risk of divergence. That's something that people that want to run their own stuff have to accept. Um, we want to be able to use, we are looking at using Atlassian tools. We use um, a Jira, Jira. Uh, a lot um, for ticketing, looking at Crucible and Fisheye to do actually the module uh, re review process. Um, so CERN, we, we, we are supposed to be um, collaborative as much as possible. The whole point of CERN is to uh, be as open and part of the internet as possible. And that's uh, one of the good things about uh, being back with the community again, rather than doing our own thing. Um, so we do want to be a good citizen, but also there are, you know, there's, there's other related deployments that we have to support anyway. Uh, so CERN IT isn't the only Puppet deployment on site. The Atlas have their own, one of their own farms, and they're using uh, Puppet, and they're doing, uh, in fact, a couple of Atlas installations. Uh, the other high energy physics uh, labs um, are uh, either starting to use um, Puppet or all going to uh, migrate to Puppet. Uh, we have a GitHub for the modules that we are starting to contribute. It's still kind of early days. It's probably about five or six on there. But that's the place we'll, uh, we'll stick things when, they, uh, when we make them. OK, so this is a bit we don't really, things that maybe we don't understand quite as well, or the things that we, we have found that we, uh, we kind of like. Um, so our initial hope when we started looking at Puppet was that everything was already done for us. So we just uh, get Puppet up and running, download a few Puppet modules, and that was it. Um, so it didn't always happen like that. Sometimes. Uh, when we, some of the modules, we don't know where to start with the modules. So there's obviously there's a few modules around that are doing the same thing. Sometimes there's uh, modules are too simple. So sometimes they're just saying this is a package file and service, and it, that that's it. And if you, there's any more variation than that, you're kind of hacking already with, without going anywhere. Uh, sometimes there's there's ones that try and give you big holistic frameworks, and I'm sure that's some people's cup of tea. We don't really like it as much for tool chains where you don't have to buy into the whole thing just to do it. Um, and there was, a, there was a blog post, actually, that went around, which was stop writing puppet modules that suck, which kind of described half of our modules that we're doing ourselves. Um, so all of our initial modules, we were putting in our own sort of CERNisms, putting in you know, IP addresses of things, and uh, auth systems, and, and subnets, and all that kind of jazz. Um, so the answer is, obviously, and it's good to see lots of talks all saying the same thing, is to separate the code and the data. And it's one of the things that Quattel did really well that we missed. We had no choice, because the software components were running on the machine. And the, if you wanted to put data in the code, then you were going to have to release RPMs every time you wanted to change anything. Um, so we're starting to do that. When we find that um, with tools like Foreman, when people, and this is not a criticism of Foreman, this is more the way that we were using it. With, when people are using like, the GUI to do things and like clicking on a module to put on, um, they don't really care about the puppet how Puppet was doing things under this, uh, the surface, and they just wanted to be able to use the global parameter. So I want SSH, and I'll click in this box and put a parameter, and that should work. Um, so obviously, that isn't helping us make uh, proper Puppet modules that are sustainable that we can send out to people. Um, so it's also good to see that Foreman's starting to do parameterized classes. That's going to help us a lot. Um, 
uh, high res, uh, or the, the answer to uh, how we've managed to make things a little bit better. Um, so we have, uh, we, we, we distribute it along with the modules and manifests. It's all in our Git repo. Uh, we're using higher GPG, which is replacing another bit of CERN. We had our own uh, Syndes, which was uh, an SSL management thing that give you all the secrets like passwords and things like that on the box. So higher GPG has, has replaced all that for us. Uh, and we're looking at DB backends for doing integration with other systems. So when we have our own monitoring stuff, monitoring half of the system is adding metrics and you're having to add metrics to, uh, and, and at the moment that's going through like a, a ticketing system and a human being's having to do it. Whereas if we integrate that with a, a higher process, so the data is just getting added in and the metrics are getting added for you, um, that, again, that's going to help us a lot. Uh, that's our higher config. I kind of put that there just to, because it might explain the next slide. Uh, so uh, we use dynamic environments. Uh, so that ends up in the uh, higher config. And the other thing we do when these nested host groups is we start off with the, the most nested. So we can nest down to four uh, and then move all the way up. Uh, and th then we have uh, higher for environment and module names. That's the kind of thing we're doing at the moment. I'm sure it will change. Um, and this is kind of an example of what we're doing. So this is with the sort of diversity we've got. So if we had a, uh, one of those clusters before called Castor, in that there's lots of different things. There's different, Castor is, sorry, it is a CERN advanced storage. It's uh, one of the things that manages things like the tapes and, and things like that. And there's lots of different hosts within a cluster within an application that are doing the same, that are under the same sort of uh, rubric. Um, so there we have uh, Castor. Uh, and in that there's three different types of Castor servers. So we've got a disk server, which is one that's uh, selected here. Uh, the experiment that it's for, so Atlas. And then the, the, the bit of that, so T0 Atlas, the sort of um, uh, Ring Zero Atlas. Um, and in that, that maps to the HARA modules, uh, so the HARA files. So it's pulling out the data. So the things like we have these variables, CNS host, node type, stage host, and such and so on and so forth. They're getting defined for the host group in the HARA as it maps to the HARA files. Um, okay, so the, uh, the other thing that we've really enjoyed is, is it is, as I say, it's really good fun being part of a vibrant community again. Um, there's probably more people in this room than have ever used Quator. <laughs> so it's, uh, it's kind of, it, things are getting fixed before we can even submit issues. So uh, a really good example of that was OpenStack. So we started looking at OpenStack in September, October uh, of last year. There was no RPMs uh, available at the time. Uh, the uh, initial community modules were sort of started coming out were Ubuntu based. Uh, and then we started getting support for Fedora and then for uh, the sort of rel alikes We use Scientific Linux, which is another uh, RHEL sort of um, copy. And we, we're, again, we're looking forward to contributing things back. Um, and and as, as we get more complex and get more complexity in our OpenStack deployment, hopefully, hopefully helping uh, uh, contribute back. Um, so we still have kind of open questions that we don't really know what to do. Um, Puppet is, is better at solving the diversity of different configurations we've got. But we've still got this problem with multiple admins. We're not really sure what to do about it. So we have the core team, and the core team should be responsible for doing things like DNS and TFTP and all that kind of thing. And we don't want every service manager to be able to have a different way of configuring what your DHCP server is or your NTP servers are. Um, so we're not quite sure how to manage that yet, how to manage the uh, whether we have a, a one Git repo for everything and how we, you know, where we put all the data. Um, we're not quite sure how to do rolling updates even across if we've got a plan of uh, 8,000 or so. Um, we don't want to have everybody get hit with the configuration all at once, so how do we manage that with, uh, with Puppet? Um, and then and sort of from a sort of source of truth point of view, we don't quite know. So there's multiple points to installations, and we're not really sure who is going to be correct. So if you have uh, Foreman, Foreman will tell you what the uh, OS will be when you next kickstart, but that doesn't count if it's a Nova image that's managed by uh, Nova. Uh, hopefully, maybe if we do Foreman with OpenStack, that'll help. Um, and then we've got the fact on the host, so what the host is actually reporting. So things like this, where we're trying to work out what is the OS correct on a machine, uh, that's something that we can't quite figure out where, where the right thing to do is. Uh, the other thing we haven't quite figured out yet is the test workflow with, with uh, Hira. Um, when we're using Hira GPG as well, then how do you, without going through a, making a whole new environment and testing, uh, we're not quite sure how to test properly um, locally on a box. Um, some of the things we want to do in the future, 
Uh, Puppet DB was already on uh, our roadmap before we came here, but now I think doubly so. Uh, and M Collective, we're not really using M Collective properly in Angular yet. We've got some ideas of what we want to do. So if you look at sort of physics jobs, um, a lot of the time they're long running jobs. So things like setting the host status of something, so saying when something is draining. So you don't want to accept any more jobs when you're draining, but you could drain for three weeks or something like that. Um, or setting a host to maintenance is uh, something. So maybe we're using M Collective to publish facts that will help us do that. So that's one thing we'll uh, start doing. And then kind of the last thing we don't, uh, some people, don't want to learn Puppet, or when the, the kind of process of somebody gets, you know, wants to test Splunk and they've got uh, Foreman open, they just want to drag and drop. How do we support that kind of use case? Should we support that kind of use case, or should we tell people they've got to get down and, and dirty and start writing code? Um, I think, yeah, okay, so that's all I've got. Uh, questions? No questions? Ah, go ahead if you get to the mic. Hi. Uh, could you talk a little bit about um, how do you manage the Puppet Masters? I mean, how many do you have currently and, you know, with the distributed, you know, different admins and stuff, how do you manage that? Right now, we've only got two, uh, and they are for the whole plant. So we, 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 will, we, are, we think we will manage when we have our own separate environments. When we start getting further out from the sort of uh, uh, pilot phase, which is pretty much where we are, I mean, we're kind of we kind of on the fun curve at the moment, where we can do things and swap things around. Um, I think um, we are going to have the idea that we'll be able to put perfect masters with a particular environment. How we manage that in terms of in terms of uh, what you're allowed to do, I'm not sure. You know, back to this stopping people doing their own DNS settings all the time. We just want people that are. Uh, the people are responsible for managing a service, providing a service, which is uh, Atlas, can, um, for instance, doing the experiments. They, don't, sh they shouldn't have to care, and we shouldn't have to have track people down when we have a bug in NSCD or something that means their resolve.conf configuration is, is, is causing them problems. So it's, we're not sure how you do that sort of security and partitioning of, of, of config data. Any other questions? Okay.